session will be recorded. If you have any audio or video problems, or if you simply want to rewatch today's session, no worries. All recordings and registrations are available on rlpnetwork.com under the training tab. During the webinar, if you have a question for Phil or David, please use the Q&A function specifically. The Q&A feature is accessible via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your desktop screen or in the three dot menu at the bottom right of your mobile device. Please note, Q&A is the only source we take questions from. Next to the Q&A icon, you will see the chat icon. Please use the chat feature to share any comments or observations with your colleagues. Ensure your chat response is set to all attendees and we will all see what you have to say. Let's try that now. Use the chat and share where you are joining us from and our great, big, beautiful country. Let's see what we're seeing. Ontario, Collingwood, hey Des. Port Perry, beautiful town in Ontario, London, Toronto, Chatham, Beaches, Milton. Let's, let's hear it for some other provinces here. All right, Calgary, finally in Alberta, BC. Welcome, welcome. Welcome everybody. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you for attending today. Courtesy of our connection through Roy LePage Meadow Town. Thank you, Gloria and Alex. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our guest, David Watt. Canadian Chief Economist, HSBC Bank of Canada since 2012. With over 25 years of experience as an economist, currency strategist, and fixed income strategist in Canada's financial sector, David is responsible for HSBC's economic forecasts with a focus on bringing the bank's global economic research to its Canadian clients. We are delighted to have David here today to share his unique national and international insights on the impacts of the pandemic that has created for our economy and our industry. A warm Royal Page welcome to you, David. Phil, please take it away. Thanks so much, uh, Kelly, and uh, great to have you join us, uh, David. It is um, uh, a pleasure to have someone from one of uh, the world's uh, great banks uh, with us today. HSBC, if I recall, that originally stood for uh, the Bank of Hong Kong, Shanghai Hong Bank. Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai Bank, yes. Yeah, that's right. Is it a London-based uh, bank worldwide? We are based in London, and uh, we have probably uh, commercial operations in more countries than any other bank. So we wow. might not be the biggest by assets, but uh, we focus on global trade challenging right now, but uh, but that's our bread and butter. And so we have commercial operations around the world. Gotcha. Now, uh, with considerable uh, experience, hundreds of years or, or hundreds of years, I don't know if it's hundreds, in yes. hundreds of years in, um, in Asia, are the challenges happening in Hong Kong uh, right now something that the, the bank would be on top of? Uh, we are paying very close attention to it, but uh, much like anybody else. And given our commercial interests in Asia, it is of a, an acute interest to us. And uh, that's as far as I'll go on that. Yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. Are you, um, are, are you a Canadian by birth? I am. Yes. As I sort and, of say uh, to people, I sort of say to people at HSBC, they've, uh, they've got a good tendency of moving people from one country to another. So global bank, you can get experience elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm probably the least mobile person because there isn't the need for a Canadian economist anywhere else in the company. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, now, did you uh, whereabouts in Canada did you grow up? Uh, outside Toronto in Brampton, if anybody's familiar with the Toronto area. So, and then uh, time in Ottawa, and then uh, and then back in Toronto where my family's living, and uh, that's where our HSBC operations are. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Uh, did you have uh, an interest in economics as a young guy, like right into university, and you knew that was your your calling? Uh, not really. I sort of fell into it almost by accident. It was almost just uh, one day I was thinking about something and uh, then realized, hey, you know what, uh, this, especially political economy stuff, not necessarily the formal economics, but the political economy stuff seems pretty interesting. And then from there, I started doing some studies about the Bank of Canada. And I thought, you know, it'd actually be a kind of a neat place to work for a while. And so I worked there for a few years and realized that, yes, it was a neat place to work, but not a place for my career. So I ended up venturing right. elsewhere. 
I, I met the, um, the outgoing governor and the incoming governor, both uh, very bright men. Did you work with uh, the incoming governor by any chance when he was at the bank? Uh, sort of. He was there, but the way the bank was structured, there were sort of uh, four silos and two buildings. And so he was in the other building and in another silo. So I certainly came across him once in a while. And a uh, very strong individual, not surprised that he eventually was made governor. And uh, I've got nothing but positive things to say about Tiff. I think it's a great pickup for the Bank of Canada to bring him back. Yeah, I, I you know, as a, uh, as a business person that obviously there's been a lot of, uh, that we, we put a lot of focus on what the central bank does, being in the real estate business and being such an interest rate uh, sensitive industry. Uh, I was very pleased uh, when he left his his post, uh, I guess, relatively brief in academia to return uh, to, to the bank. I think it was great for Canada. Yeah, it's going to be a very good pickup. I think we're going to find uh, that it was a very good choice. And again, he was, he's got a great international reputation and the work he's done internationally during the financial crisis when he was working at the government of Canada rather than the Bank of Canada when he was at the federal government working with uh, the G7 and the G20. Uh, he really did a lot of work that helped set the stage for the economic recovery globally. So, it, so he comes there with uh, some pretty some pretty good uh, some pretty good decision making and some pretty good international contacts for the bank. Well, that's good, and and Lord knows we need him now. So that's a uh, that's good timing. Listen, um, I'm going to turn things over uh, to you to the to the folks online. We wanted a uh, to to let you have. Uh, something of a global and then a dr drilled down, drilled down view on what's happening in, in in the economy. It is we're all in this together around the world, and and uh, certainly what happens in in Asia and Europe and and of course in the United States has great bearing on what happens uh, to us here in Canada. Uh, and all of the pieces uh, impact the uh, Canadian real estate industry and the Canadian housing industry. So um, really pleased to uh, have Davis give a, David give us a, a, a view on uh, where he sees uh, our economy today and where it might be going. And I'll ask him a couple of questions. And as Kelly said at the outset, if you have some, some questions, please put them in the chat and we'd be... Uh, happy to, to address them for you. So David, why don't I turn it over to you? I know you have a, a few charts to, to share and that'll I'm sure trigger yeah, some you. questions. Uh, very good, thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Uh, I'm going to do a share screen. So if you happen to see me on the camera and I'm looking down, I'm not falling asleep. I'm actually looking at the presentation, uh, hopefully as you are seeing it. So let's get this uh, uh, set up and get things started. And as soon as my screen pops up, there we go. All right. Uh, usually Very I walk attractive uh, COVID-19. Uh, yes, that order. came from our global chief economist. That, this is an image she used. So they like to spiff up the presentation. So um, I, if I look like I'm moving around a little bit, it's because usually when I do a presentation, I'm on a stage and I'm walking around. So I'm feeling a bit constrained. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, title of this presentation is A Perfect Storm. Uh, and the way I like to describe that is rather than talk about specifically COVID or the decline in oil prices, I really talk about uh, what's going on now as a perfect storm has hit the Canadian economy. Uh, I'll build up the pieces of that through the presentation. Uh, but of course, two of the key building blocks are COVID and the decline in oil prices. And I'll talk about another key aspect of that uh, in a few minutes. Now, the one thing we're focusing on now is the containment measures that we've been under. Uh, they have been successful in slowing the spread of COVID. So the daily infection rate uh, is down to around 1,000, maybe slightly less than 1,000 based on the most recent data. This is from a couple of days ago. And given the success on that containment, slowing the infection rate, we are now seeing a number of provinces that are moving towards opening up their economies. Uh, but we've already seen in Quebec and in Alberta and potentially also in Ontario, uh, some setbacks. And what this sort of highlights is that even though we're now past the point of wondering 
how big the slowdown is going to be and how big of an economic hit to the hopeful sign that as things begin to open, uh, we have to realize that there's going to be irregular progress. So we'll talk about that a little while later in discussing the economic recovery. But what it's going to do is it's going to spread the economic recovery over a period of months. Usually when you see a recession, it would be hard into it and hopefully quick out of it, V-shape. Uh, but this time it just seems like it's going to be challenging to get that traditional V-shape recovery. And I'll discuss that a little bit more going forward. Now, HSBC, we recently revised our economic forecasts for a number of countries around the world. Uh, one of them was Canada. I recently changed our forecast. And what we generally did was we lowered our forecasts. So I now look for the Canadian economy to decline by 11.2% in the second quarter uh, and by 55% in, in, the, in the second quarter, pardon me, 55% in the second quarter. And that leads to about an 11% decline in GDP this year. Now, Bank of Canada Governor Stephen Polos was recently out and he said that the economic impact of COVID is going to be towards the best case scenario for the Bank of Canada. In April, they forecast that GDP could decline by between 15 and 30% from the end of 2019 level. Uh, while my forecasts sound dire, uh, my forecast is that GDP will decline by 20% from, uh, from that end of 2019 level. So even though my forecast might sound bearish, uh, it's not really that bearish compared to the Bank of Canada's. And, that, and that's, again, by a degree of uh, how, how much the economic hit from COVID has been, that you'll be talking about a decline of 15% in the level of GDP as being possibly somewhat optimistic. Uh, it just sort of shows you the scale. And no economy that, uh, especially not in Canada, has gone through that degree of economic hit. So, so we really are in unprecedented times. And then our hope now and our focus is less on the hit that we're taking in the first and second quarter, and now hopefully on potentially the speed of the recovery. Now, one aspect that we focused on with at HSBC with regard to the economic hit and some of the lingering after effects during the recovery is that we entered this slowdown with a lot of debt. A lot of economies were carrying a lot of debt. So in some countries, it's constrained the amount of fiscal policy that they can provide. Uh, and in other countries, it's raising concern about who is going to carry the burden of growth going forward. Uh, in Canada, we've had a history over the last several years of having the consumer step up and carry the burden of debt and the burden of growth. Uh, that's going to be more challenging and that's getting towards that other perfect, the other issue of the uh, perfect storm that Canada is facing that I'll talk about more specifically in a little while. Now let's get a picture on what the level of economic activity is going to look like. Uh, as I said, my forecast is for a decline of 11% in Q1 and 55% in Q2. Uh, this shows you just how far off course the level of economic activity has been, has been knocked by COVID and oil prices. Now, the dotted line there is basically a forecast based on the Bank of Canada's estimate of potential GDP growth. And what you sort of see is not only do I have the level of economic activity remaining lower, than it was at the end of 2019 through the end of 2021, you see how far it is from where we might have been otherwise. And this just gives you an idea of the loss of economic potential and the, and the loss of capacity in the Canadian economy uh, and basically how big of a hole we're still going to have to dig out of when we're going into 2022. So that's the idea that uh, not only is COVID having the impact now, there's going to be a lingering effect going forward and as you look at the picture itself, uh, you will hear people talk about what's the shape of the recovery, a V-shape, a U-shape, W, an L. Uh, I don't think it's going to fit neatly into any of those uh, particular alphabetic uh, circumstances or paradigms, because what we will see is the spread out recovery in Q3 and Q4, and then we have to discuss what's the economic outlook going to look like through 2021. I've got a relatively modest outlook, and I will build that story up through the presentation. Now, one of the good aspects about Canada is that even though we can talk about the level of debt in a number of other countries, at the federal level in Canada, we had quite a bit of fiscal room for a response. So you sort of see that the federal government programs have, are going to potentially lead to a, a federal deficit of 12.8% this year. 
Uh, that's much bigger fiscal response than we saw in 2008, 2009, not a surprise given that the economic hit this time has been much more direct to Canada, whereas in 2008, 2009, the financial crisis had only an indirect blow on the economy. But you see here just how far off course the fiscal policy has been not. Uh, the economic and fiscal update from December 1999 is on that chart and you see just how big uh, the deficit is going to be for this year and for next year. And that's simply because the federal government responded quickly and in size in order to help offset uh, the impact of the COVID restrictions. Specifically, uh, given that so many people lost their jobs and lost income, the federal government was quick to bring in income support measures, which again is something I'll, I'll allude to later. And with the response on the fiscal side, we're going to see the federal debt level increase quite sharply. The parliamentary budget officer suggests that the debt to GDP ratio could rise toward 50%. And again, this is far off course where we projected, where, we, where the federal government had projected the debt to GDP ratio to go over the next few years. We're not sure how quickly it will, it will return to the old or if it even will be able to return to the old trajectory. But let's just say uh, right now we've got a fiscal situation uh, and there's some uncertainties over how the federal government is going to build its way out of it. Is it going to increase taxes? Is it going to introduce new taxes? And basically, how is what revenue tools is it going to use in order to get the deficit under control? And again, some of the responses at the federal and at the provincial level can affect the pace of the economic recovery in 2021 and 2022. But of course, it wasn't only the federal government that responded aggressively. The Bank of Canada didn't sit on its hands either. Uh, it chopped the policy rate from 1.75 down to 0.25, which it now calls the effective lower bound. Uh, as a little aside, some people might be wondering, is the Bank of Canada going to go negative? Uh, I would say most likely, uh, very likely, no, they will not go negative. The bank is not interested in putting rates into negative territory. Po Governor Polas has made that statement. Uh, incoming Governor Tiff Macklin has alluded to that as well. And other members of the governing council have clearly indicated that negative rates are not an eager option for them to use. We at HSBC have also recently published work that sort of shows that the economies and the central banks that have used negative interest rates uh, have not really had much success from their use. So if it's not something that's very useful and if it could potentially be disruptive to financial markets, uh, why would you want to use them? And at the same time, what we're going on now, uh, this next slide, what we've sort of seen is the Bank of Canada has been increasing the size of its balance sheet, buying assets, asset purchase programs, and the key goal of most of these programs has been to support uh, the functioning of, of financial markets and support the well-functioning of uh, liquidity and credit markets. So if negative interest rates are potentially going to impair financial markets, and you've just spent hundreds of billions of dollars to support financial markets, why would you bring in a policy that could potentially lean against your other efforts? So possibility of negative interest rates in Canada, very, very slim. I would not uh, bank on it at all. And the Bank of Canada has specifically split up that the monetary policy actions on the interest rate and the financial support mechanisms the buildup of the balance sheet. Now, there is always the possibility that the Bank of Canada might have to do more on the monetary policy front, but they've already started to open the door to that with the possibility that they could buy more government bonds. Now, this is, shows you the buildup of the Bank of Canada balance sheet. And you see specifically that it's been right now, the increases come from treasury bills, some purchases of government bonds, and largely from uh, term repurchase agreements. The only important thing there is really to focus on that most of the increase in the Bank Canada balance sheet has been at short-term instruments and money market securities. That's got two important aspects. One, it supports the functioning of credit markets, especially short-term credit markets. The other aspect is, should the economic recovery get on pace relatively optimistically, uh, a lot of these programs will naturally dissipate. And so concerns about whether or not this is setting the stage for inflation can dissipate because a lot of these assets will mature and they no longer will be lingering on the Bank of Canada balance sheet. So while there might be some concern is the Bank of Canada setting the stage for an inflation, I think that's a debate for another day and it's not something that I think we really need to worry about until uh, much later in the cycle. Now, some details on the hit that COVID has had on the Canadian economy. The chart here is the monthly change in Canadian employment on a month-to-month -month basis for the full history of the data that we have. You see what happened in March. 
uh, employment fell by 1 million, historically unprecedented, way off the charts in terms of historical norms. Then we had April. It was another historical anomaly, uh, way off the charts again, and it, and it was almost double what we saw the decline in March. That gets to the idea about the economic hit and the disruption that it's caused to the Canadian economy. That's why the federal government responded as quickly as it did, why it brought in the CERB program in order to replace lost income, because 3 million people in Canada basically lost their jobs over the span of two weeks. And, and, and that's the way it sort of spelled out. Most of it occurred through late March. And now the other aspect of the economic impact uh, was the hours work declined. And this is the one that we'll be paying a lot of attention to in the next couple of months. Uh, our total hours worked in the Canadian economy fell to a level last seen in 1995. Uh, it's an absolute sharp decline in hours worked in the total economy. So for hourly wage workers, you can certainly see the impact that it has had. And the decline in hours worked was in a number of industries, accommodation and food services, information and culture, a wholesale retail trade, construction, other services. The interesting, or not the interesting aspect to this, but a feature of where we saw the economic losses in terms of labor is much different than we see in typical cycles. Typically, what you would see is cyclical industries like construction and manufacturing would suffer the bulk of the job losses or the bulk of the loss in hours work. They tend to be industries that are largely staffed or more a majority staffed by men. With the decline that we've seen here, accommodation and food services, information and culture, the balance is more towards women than men. So you'll see people talk about this as a she session. And that's because we have had this imbalance that most cyclical downturns don't tend to hit female employment. This one did. And the part that we're going to have to pay close attention to is a lot of these industries are also going to be among the last to recover. Going back to restaurants, going back to hotels, going back to theaters. Uh, there's going to be concerns about social distancing. So those could actually, while they led the way into this recession, could be the last to come out of it. And again, that's going to be one of those lingering after effects of, of this downturn and the effect that it could have on women in the labor force. Other aspects about what happened with COVID, historic declines in consumer confidence and business confidence. And these are two that the Bank of Canada will be watching closely as they try to gauge the rebound of the economy. Now we have had business confidence that's rebounded to an extent, given the aggressive response of fiscal and monetary policy given that we are now moving towards opening up as opposed to shutting down, which we were through most of March and April, uh, businesses are starting to get a little bit more optimistic, but that's in context. Uh, They're still very cautious and a number of businesses are still facing numerous struggles and a great deal of uncertainty as to the pace at which they will reopen and also the potential at which they will be able to rehire their staff. Now, the other aspect that I haven't really talked about that we've been dealing with in Canada is the decline in oil prices. Now, the decline in oil prices got a lot of attention uh, in, in mid-April when oil prices seemed to go negative. They didn't go negative. Uh, I don't remember getting paid when I go to the gasoline station for it to fill up. Uh, it was a technical thing with the futures market and the oil price market. When I think about oil prices and people still will say, well, has the rebound in oil prices eased this pressure on the oil patch? Simple answer is no. Uh, the chart here on the right hand side where it looks at uh, Canadian dollar or, or oil hedged three years forward in Canadian dollars. What you'd basically see is 2009, 2010, 2011, when we came out of the last recession or the, the, the financial crisis, oil prices were fairly high and that helped spark a rebound in the oil patch, investment in the oil patch, in, and, and employment in the oil patch, and it really helped carry the Canadian economy out of that recession and set the stage for economic growth. 2014, things changed, oil prices fell, the oil patch basically started to slow down, investment slowed, employment declined, and now we've basically been hit once again. So even though oil prices have rebounded, the level of oil price that Canadian oil producers are looking at is still quite a bit lower. And so that suggests that the oil patch itself is still facing some intense headwinds at the present time, even though we're talking about COVID, the COVID effect uh, beginning to dissipate as hopefully uh, economies begin to reopen, that oil story still remains a distinct headwind for the Canadian economy. And what it's going to do specifically is it's going to limit income growth in Canada. 
Uh, this is a chart of the Bank of Canada Commodity Price Index and the terms of trade. The terms of trade is a key impact, is a key indicator basically between the level of economic output and the level of income that we receive. So when the terms of trade is going up, it means that usually the Canadian dollar is strengthening and the Canadian dollar is worth more around the world. Uh, when the terms of trade is declining, it basically means the Canadian dollar is worth less around the world and it basically squeezes our ability to spend and consume. So what we're basically seeing now is unlike in 2008, 2009, when terms of trade increased sharply, helped support consumer spending, helped support the oil patch, we're gonna be facing a greater challenge now. And then that, that, that limit on income growth is gonna be an important factor in our ability to manage our debt levels that I'll talk about in a minute. I'll go past that one because it's not really necessary and I'll get right to this one. Now, when I talked about the perfect storm for the Canadian economy, the other aspect of the perfect storm wasn't just COVID or oil. It's clearly the fact that one of the issues that we've been watching quite closely over the past few years at HSBC has been the level of debt in the Canadian economy and the vulnerability of households to rising interest rates and job loss. Now we've had rising interest rates between 2017 to 2000, late 2018, the Bank of Canada was raising interest rates. The impact of that was to raise the debt service ratio from a manageable 13.5% to a record high 15%. So all of a sudden people that were carrying a high level of debt and were now facing higher debt service ratios and the household sector was being squeezed. But so long as the job market stayed strong, we could get by. But it left the household sector vulnerable to an income shock or an employment shock, which is basically exactly what COVID was. Now there's two charts here that show uh, some of the strains in the household sector. One is consumer insolvency proposals. Oh, I just noticed that I have a spelling mistake there. Nobody caught that before. Uh, as interest rates went up, what we started to see was more and more households beginning to struggle. So more and more households ended up asking for relief from their debts. So they started to go through consumer insolvency proposals. That reflected, again, uh, high levels of debt, rising interest rates made it difficult for families to get by. So that was already on the way up before COVID hit. It's going to get worse now. We'd also had, uh, specifically relative to the mortgage market, looking at mortgage arrears. Now it takes about two years for interest rates to have an impact on mortgage arrears. So the Bank of Canada started to raise rates in 2017. So sometime in 2019, we were beginning to say, you know what, we might see some people falling behind on their mortgages and starting to uh, see mortgage arrears begin to rise. It hadn't really happened yet, but it was something we were aware of. But the key aspect that we've been focusing on was while interest rates going up might cause an increase in mortgage arrears, so long as the, un so long as the unemployment rate stayed low, people could get by. Well, now we've had this shock and the unemployment rate is at 13%. And you might've heard the CMHC head recently say that he could, you could see mortgage arrears hit 20% coming out of this. Now that's uh, extremely high given where mortgage arrears are, are right now, but it does highlight some of the strains in the mortgage market. I'm sure you're all aware that 722,000 mortgages, at least that's the last number I have, have gone through deferrals. That's roughly 15% of outstanding mortgages. As we go through the recovery, as some of the people who've lost their jobs go back into employment and begin to get their income back, uh, they will be able to manage their, hopefully to manage their expenses going forward. But there are certainly going to be some who will struggle. Some companies won't open, some people won't get their jobs back again. So it sets up this stage, especially through 2021, uh, of a number of people in a number of industries and in a number of sectors struggling and a number of people basically not being able to keep up with their financial obligations. So what that sort of sets the stage for is this hangover from past debt levels, uh, basically having an impact and restraining the ability of the consumer to carry growth going forward. Uh, I don't necessarily need to draw a straight line to the implications for the housing market. I'm not necessarily bearish on the housing market, but it does suggest that some of the underlying factors that it helps support the housing market are not going to be there to the same degree that they were during the past cycle. And a couple of other aspects about, uh, and this cut this two more charts and that's it. Other aspects about uh, the housing market that might be relevant here uh, and related to COVID. 
is we know that the federal government has been increasing the immigration total for Canada. Uh, it had been 250,000, they increased it to around 300,000. And the expectation is over the next couple of years, it will rise to 350,000 per year. Uh, it's unclear if that's going to be able to be maintained given some of the COVID restrictions. Uh, we'll have to wait and see how that evolves going forward. And the other chart there basically breaks down uh, some of the other growth in the population. What we tend to see during economic downturns is population growth slows. So there's the possibility of, say, non-permanent residents slowing down. That's been a key aspect of population growth over the past couple of years. We know population growth last year was 1.6%, the best, best basically in over a decade. And that came partly from immigration, which is part of the gray bars, and also from non-permanent residents, that is students, temporary workers. It's unclear what's going to happen with international students. We've got a number of schools that are already concerned about their fiscal, especially universities, their fiscal situation, because since they charge international students higher tuition, if they don't come back, all of a sudden these universities have fiscal issues. Uh, same thing could happen for companies that might've been relying on temporary workers. Are they going to be coming back? What's going to be the COVID related issues in limiting basically temporary workers? So these are all sort of issues which weigh on the ability of the Canadian economy uh, to grow through population growth. And this creates another one of those uncertainties that to the extent that, that immigrant community was a key source of driver of the housing market, uh, this creates an uncertainty. We can't say whether how negative it will be. It just creates a level of uncertainty at the present time, unless we start getting things like a vaccine for COVID. But this creates that degree of uncertainty. Now, one last chart here. I do not market myself as a housing expert. Uh, and the only reason I put this chart up is because it is another one of those indicators that uh, the head of CMHC, Evan Siddall, has talked about recently where he predicts that home prices could fall between nine and 18%. Uh, and I basically just show the chart here about how much that could be. Uh, and while I don't necessarily wanna say whether I agree or disagree with that particular forecast, all I will sort of say is that there are certain aspects that have been supporting the housing market that we have now more uncertainty over. Uh, the ability of households, the income level that's being generated by households. Are they going to be able to generate the same level of income to carry the amount of mortgages? It creates uncertainty. Uh, immigration and the possibility that immigration is going to slow relative to recent trends over the past few years creates a degree of uncertainty. And so while I don't necessarily want to go out there as a bearish forecast because I've been bearish on the housing market before and got burned and I'm not going to go out there and say that again, all I will sort of say is that from my perspective, looking at the macroeconomic backdrop, there's more uncertainty over the housing market and a number of other aspects of the Canadian economy. Hopefully things will, it will unfold positively and, and my concerns will prove minor, uh, but I am quite certain that relative to what we've seen over past economic cycles, the consumer can, cannot carry the burden of growth for the Canadian economy coming out of this cycle, given the particular vulnerability we had to an income shock and the magnitude of the income shock from COVID and the decline in oil prices. Uh, but again, the, the one thing I also tend to focus on from an economic perspective, what we can hopefully get from going forward from the fiscal policy perspective is what we need is a, to spark business investment and a focus on competitiveness for our exports. Uh, basically what that means is basically we have to focus on shifting our economy uh, towards the high value added, high tech industries in order to deal with growth on the services side, which also tend to be higher income, higher income uh, sectors in order to help drive the Canadian economy going forward because we just don't have the Canadian consumer in the back pocket anymore. And that is the end of my comments and I will stop sharing my screen now. Well, thank you for that. Uh, it's a... Uh... It's a fascinating time to be an economist. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's fascinating, but also it's very challenging because you, you, in the past, you would use rules of thumb. If there's an economic slowdown, how, how much will the economy rebound? Then you can characterize, okay, well, if we get fiscal stimulus, we can get a V-shaped recovery. Uh, we can't characterize this one. For example, how quickly will, will restaurants bounce back? Even if restaurants open, uh, will people want to go back to them? And so it just creates this uncertainty that uh, literally when you're trying to say what's going to happen to the economy, everybody has to start out by saying, I've never seen anything like this before. So there's no 
rules of thumb to describe what the recovery should look like. And as a result of that, also, I would say, if you're reading stuff from other economists, uh, you might get a wide range of potential outcomes because uh, we're all basically flying blind. Yeah, no, and and you see that in the uh, in the comments you get from, for example, in the housing industry, some of the leading economists who who have been fairly good at uh, pegging the the chart the Canadian housing industry has taken feel like they're flying blind uh, right now. Few, I will say, those who focus on the housing industry specifically uh, are anywhere near as negative as the outgoing uh, head of CMHC. He would be uh, at the extreme in terms of in terms of those who we regularly follow. There's always uh, obviously the housing bears like uh, capital economics and things who've been yeah. predicting 20% declines in house uh, prices for uh, well, yeah. probably 15 years. But uh, even the even the governor Polis uh, had to respond to the the um, at first somewhat flippant comment coming out of CMHC regarding uh, home prices uh, not recovering until 2022 with no supporting data, and then they did come out uh, uh, on Twitter of all places, remind me of uh, President Trump with um, uh, some comments and and numbers. So. It sounds like the uh, the modeling, the models that CMHC has used uh, aren't giving them the kind of uh, uh, certainty either. And yeah. uh, I know we we aren't paying the same kind of attention we usually do to their uh, outlook because it, it seems to be an outlier. Well, and then that is tough. Like models that you would have relied on in the past aren't built to deal with this sort of thing. So so it does make it very hard. Like you, you build a model, you trust the model, and you sort of know that things just might not unfold the way you anticipate. Uh, the other aspect is, uh, I know when I've been doing, when I was doing my forecast for Q1 and Q2, uh, it went from being a forecasting exercise to almost just doing the mathematics. And then this, right. whatever the mathematics say, you know, well, if restaurants are, if 60% of restaurants are closed, okay, that's 60% off that industry. If movie theaters are closed, that's 70% off that industry. And you just do the math and you're like, Oh, jumping jeepers. This is going to be a massive economic decline. And it took a while to actually, the, for me to actually submit my forecasts. Cause it's like, I don't know that I could put in a forecast like this. And right. then after a while right. you get to the point of like, well, you know, this is, this is just what the math says is going to happen. So I think to an extent they might be involved in that sort of thing, as opposed to actually estimating the psychology, what is there going to be a return to the housing market? Are people going to use this to move up in the market? Are there going to be forced sales? Is there going to be a price impact on that? Is there going to be latent demand that's lingering in the backdrop? Uh, literally, we don't know until things start to evolve. Right. Now, it, one thing you might be interested in, and then Environics uh, research that was done in February and in May, uh, there was a sharp increase in the number of uh, buyers who expect to enter the market with less than 20% down. Uh, this leads me to believe these are first time home buyers and they see, uh, particularly in our big expensive cities, they see uh, an opportunity to get into the market uh, that just didn't exist before. Yeah, and I think one thing that we will need to watch for quite closely is it could be that once we, the COVID restrictions come off, you do get that burst of activity. We're starting to see some of that in the United States. Uh, and you might get that confidence that all the market's rebounding, everything's fine. Uh, but I would sort of say you still have to be somewhat cautious because the income effect of what's gone on with COVID, uh, the deferrals, the tax deferrals, uh, even with the, the CERB, I mean, it's going to be taxable. People might not, people might not realize that it's going to be taxable. Uh, and the people, the industries that might not bounce back as quickly as we think. So there, there is going to be a lingering after effect. So even if you get a bounce, you always have to keep in your mind that at some point, uh, you know, the, the credit's going to dry up, the income decline is going to pinch. It's again, it's not a bearish forecast. It's just keep it in the back of your mind that these are issues that people are going to be having to deal with. And on top of the idea that we are going to see mortgage arrears are going to increase, uh, consumer insolvencies are going to increase, uh, credit might become tighter as, as mortgage lenders get more cautious about being more aggressive in terms of uh, investigating before they lend people, depending on the industry you're in, if you've got greater income uncertainty. 
So there are going to be challenges for the industry going forward. Uh, Derek Burleson from uh, TD, the deputy chief there, mm -hmm. economist, uh, suggested a couple of days ago that their research indicates 90% of those laid off feel they will get their job back shortly, that they were temporary layoffs. What do you think about that number? Is that optimistic? I think that's a tad on the optimistic side. I, I hope that they're right. I, I mean, like mo the economy was doing fine and then this completely knocked us off course. Uh, and again, it's over the time that you're going to get that. Uh, how many restaurants are not going to be re be opening once again? Uh, what's going to be the change in consumer behavior? Is that going to have lasting impact on a number of industries? Is, is, is the Toronto theater industry going to rebound the way that it did? We had tickets to see Hamilton. If Hamilton comes back and we get a chance to see tickets, do we take them? I really want right. to see Hamilton, but I'm just not sure if I want to go sit in a theater with uh, 300 other people. Uh, right. So there will be some lingering after effects. And to the extent that there are those demand shifts and uh, the businesses that close or say restaurants that uh, have to go through social distancing, uh, it does mean that there are going to be people who might technically get their job back, but you might get 10% of the hours that you got before or 50% of the hours, hopefully, that you got before. And so there are going to be lingering after effects on the economy. It, it, it's just going to create uh, uh, the lack of vibrancy that we might have seen in other rebounds. Now, the, la the, the vast majority of people that were laid off uh, in la the latter part of March, April and into May have been in, uh, call it part-time jobs or Peep, uh, youth, uh, young workers, say 25 and under. You mentioned the the uh, the, the she session, and and we know there's um, that employment in in uh, uh, restaurants and uh, travel and tourism and retail uh, skews uh, towards women and young women. Do you, of course, all these these groups are that they're they're not participants in the in the housing they tend to be renters they're not participants at this stage of their lives in the housing industry to the certain degree do you even if there is some lingering impact in those industries what do you see the sort of carry on impact to the 70% of Canadians and our homeowners who might be trading in real estate well and that gets the idea that like not not all segments of the housing market are created equal uh, yeah. So I'd say like the, the market, the, the market, if you're marketing more towards people who are lower income, lower carrying costs, uh, some aspects of the condo market, that might suffer a little bit more. People who have, who are in condos who basically were, were struggling to get by might not be able to get by now. Uh, so I could see some strain showing up there. Uh, in the single family housing market, uh, I don't expect significant weakness. Now, when, while I talked about the loss of jobs in some of the accommodation and food services, as you, as you indicate, the way I sort of phrase it is uh, what we basically saw was a lot of job losses in lower wage industries. Uh, as you indicated, part-time and, uh, and people who are less uh, deeply involved in the labor market. Uh, the other way to focus it is if you look at higher wage in individuals, say those earning $30, out, $30 per hour and above, uh, to a large extent, they emerged unscathed to an extent from, from the COVID response. Some of them might have lost some hours. Uh, some people might be working from home as opposed to what they did before. So you might actually be working more hours than you were when you're actually in the office. Uh, so that aspect of the market has not really been has not really suffered. Yeah, and so, yeah. so that's why when I hear stories about the housing market, it's like I can see a scenario based on some of the economic statistics, but when you drill down into it, uh, I think the single family market in most of the major industries or in most of the major cities, pardon me, uh, is likely going to be relatively firm and that we'll be keep, people will keep waiting for it to break and, uh, and it won't. I think there will be some signs of weakness. Some people might go through forced sales because they will have been uh, in problems with COVID and their ability to carry the mortgage that they've got at the present time. Uh, but I think that we'll, and again, like I do think the mortgage arrears will increase. Uh, but I'm not at the point where I'm, I'm extremely bearish about the single family housing market. I think it will be, it will come through relatively well 
uh, as we go through the recovery. I just don't think we're going to enter the tre upward trends that we had before because the credit and the demand lifeblood, I think to an extent will be weaker than it was say over the last 10 to 15 years. Right. One of the things that's occurred to this stage of the, of the uh, pandemic response has been um, a, an almost lockstep drop in the supply of homes for sale and, and the people in market looking for those homes. So the, the relative supply demand uh, push pull that's occurring in the market has been really remarkably stable, almost like, like, like two divers or, yeah. or dolphins or something. Um, is it possible to have, say volume volumes down by half in an industry, yet the supply of, uh, and that demands down by half, yet the supply of your product is, is uh, considerably lower than that's necessary, even to, even to uh, satisfy that, that half uh, drop. Is it possible to have rising prices in, in, a, in a much smaller uh, industry? Have you seen that happen before? Uh, that's pretty specific, but, uh, again, is it, is it possible that an imbalance between demand and supply? Like, sure. Uh, as things rebound, people who were maybe not significantly hit by COVID other than not being able to leave their house might go, well, we were planning to move before, so let's go out and look for a new house. Uh, whereas if people, if you have some, a group of people who might've been struggling financially before, uh, they've got mortgage deferrals and they've got a number of other programs that are giving them income support for the next little while. So it might be, you could see uh, the demand rebound before supply. Yeah. But and, again, and that's an idea. We need to wait and see once the mortgage deferrals are passed, once the CERB is passed, and once the economy is up standing on its own two feet again, okay, now let's get a test of what's going on with income, what's going on with consumer demand, what's going on with the housing market. And that might not be until 2021. Uh, and if things don't go well, uh, we could end up seeing these programs pushed forward. And so you could certainly see that idea that there is a, a latent demand of people who want to move uh, and, uh, and a limited supply because the people who might in other circumstances have to sell uh, don't have to at the present time because of the government programs. Right, right. A couple of questions, then we'll turn to the audience. Um, immigration is stalling around the world. The movement of movement of people is stalling around the world. In based on our research, new Canadians typically take about three years before they they uh, in in material numbers uh, become owners. But by the time it hits seven years they actually have a higher degree of home ownership than people born in candidates, like 72.3%. So the people, the, 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 uh, the dearth of new, in, of new immigrants that we're seeing right now, the, the, the drop, it won't have an immediate impact on the uh, home purchasing or, or the, the, the purchase uh, of homes in Canada because they wouldn't be buying homes anyways. They'd be landing and, and sort of getting oriented. Uh, but it could three years down the road. Do you, is that, will that, that kind of a wave sort of, will we see a blip in the future? Say, say if we have a, a, a one year drop in immigration to a significant level, three years out, will we see a, a drop in demand or is it is it not that, that one on one relationship? Uh, I would, if I was going to be watching for where that might show up, I would be looking more at things like housing starts ah, okay. and, the, uh, and the idea of the demographic forecast for various cities. Okay. What's if, if the growth here was driven by immigration over the past 10 years, okay, well, like is the housing stock now, how much does it need to increase? Well, we right. thought it had to increase by 20%. Now it's only 10%. Right. And so you just see that housing starts begin to decline. It's, it's almost like, I'd say just to draw an analogy, it's almost like what we saw in the oil patch where you have an amount of investment based on what you think the output's going to be. And then all of a sudden the prices decline and demand drops and right. you just, the investment is the one that's the key driver. And so I, I would look more at, uh, at the housing starts as opposed to, uh, as opposed to housing, housing sales in that regard. Yeah, no, that makes sense. One last question for you before I turn it back to the audience. The, 
the uh, you mentioned that there was a or you walked through the the dramatic decline in the uh, the bank the central bank's uh, target rate and and we're starting to see the impact of those those lower interest rates that's yeah. going to impact the federal government's cost of borrowing as well isn't it I wonder how much capacity they've gained in terms of uh, carrying debt with with interest rates being much lower than they were at the beginning of the year have, have you seen that number do we have some buffer before our taxes go up uh do we have a, that's a tough one because it, you've got short term and longer term issues that get mixed up with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've seen now ha has has the decline in interest rates had an effect? Sure. Uh, federal government is borrowing massive amounts of treasury bills. So the yield that they're going to be paying over the next one to three months has declined sharply. Uh, the lasting impact on debt and the debt carrying costs will depend on things like what happens with inflation in the future. Uh, we've got uh, some people that are saying, and the Bank of Canada has said, that the demand destruction will outweigh supply effects and supply, like the fact that some goods might be sold out, and so you might get uh, profiteering. And so inflation is not right. going to be an issue from their perspective. Not for a while, and some people will, might say, like, well, maybe three to four years down the road. You know, who knows? Possible, but the Bank of Canada still has a credible inflation target. So I'm not really all that concerned about an inflation about an inflation backdrop. Uh, and so that means that interest rates, I think, in general, will stay relatively relatively low. And for the federal government specifically right now, what's going on is uh, what doesn't get enough attention is that a lot of the borrowing that they're doing right now is in short-term instruments. While they've been issuing some bonds, a lot of it has been treasury bills. So say one, three, and 12-month treasury bills. Uh, if the economy begins to rebound, they will let those treasury bills mature. And so right. they will, the debt will come back down. And so, so, so we really have to sort of get it in context that we're not going to have a V-shaped recovery and have this lingering overhead of high debt levels because right. federal government right. revenues will start coming back and these treasury bills will begin to decline. If, if now, if So relative to a lot of nations on earth, uh, and now I know this is a relative term, we're in, we're in better shape than many. Yes, yeah, so I was, I think I was going on a, a, off a tangent on that, but. Yes, uh, and I would also sort of make one other point. Uh, going into this crisis, uh, I would much rather have the federal government carry the cost of a lot of these programs than the provincial governments. Right. Uh, the federal government is in much better shape financially to be able to carry the short-term hit, such as what we're seeing with COVID. Uh, a number of provinces have been downgraded or face downgrade risk. So if we leave the fiscal cost on them, uh, there will be for the potential for more and more disruptive tax increases, whereas the federal government has better fiscal capacity to manage it and more tools, more inventive and less disruptive tools to potentially raise revenue in the future. So, so having the federal government bear the cost, I think is actually a very positive, very, very positive thing yeah. for the potential for the Canadian economy going forward. Okay, well, that's great, Kelly. Um, do you have some questions? I realize questions, distilling them with uh, a topic <laughs> like this is putting some uh, some some stress on our producers. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Lots of questions you've already answered uh, through the process, but one point of clarification, um, David, as it relates to your slide on mortgages and defaults, were, were, were those slides related to strictly residential mortgages or did they include commercial as well? That is residential mortgages. That's uh, Canadian Bankers Association mortgage arrears. So 4 million outstanding residential mortgages. And, and so that is specifically for residential. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, we have a question from Chris Harding and he's wondering what the benefit of, you know, Evan Siddall's comment was about raising mortgage down payments from 5% to 10% during this economic uncertainty and a high household debt, why would they consider doing something like that? And can you expand on that comment? Uh, partly, I think it's just to, to, well, for homeowners themselves, basically to be carrying more of the cost and they have more skin in the game to begin with when they're getting into a house. But I think it's also the idea that they just wanna make sure that people don't go into uh, buying a house and become over leveraged too quickly. I think it's just this recognition that uh, that uh, that the the credit market and the mortgage market 
uh, might not be as easy as it was before. And there are going to be more restrictions in, in credit allocation. You know, the, the credit approval process is going to be much more onerous than it is going forward. And he just wants to make sure that when, ho when homeowners are going into the housing market, make sure that you've done your homework, make sure you've got your finances in order and make sure that you're able to carry uh, more of the short-term risk in the housing market before you actually begin to get into a mortgage. So how maybe I, you, sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, I just thought I'd add um, the, um, the head of CMHC doesn't, just for the uh, folks on the call, does not determine that on their own. It's typically the Minister of Finance, uh, the Department of Finance that determines what the uh, minimum down payment will be and what the federal government will support in terms of um, uh, backing that with their housing agency, CMHC, and board, and uh, and we have submitted a response that essentially indicated that that we believe the the uh, Canadian consumer, the housing consumer, and particularly first time home, home buyers, based on some of the stuff I was sharing earlier about the uptick uh, in interest with a, improved affordability. Uh, is is uh, going to be an important piece of the, the recovery puzzle and uh, doubling the minimum down payment requirements uh, would uh, hinder the overall economic recovery. And we felt there were other mechanisms in place, including the, uh, the stress test and banks internal uh, controls themselves that would be adequate to uh, ensure that uh, debt levels didn't rise too precipitously. So that's a real estate company CEO's perspective on, on doubling the uh, down, minimum down payment required at this stage. We don't think it's a, a great idea and we've let, uh, let the federal government know. So so is the Canadian real estate industry. Uh, decision hasn't been made yet. Obviously CMHC is a very important, um, a very important uh, part of the policy making decisions around housing and the economy overall. So who knows where that one's gonna go. How strict do we expect mortgage rules for borrowers to become? Or, you know, what, what other levers might be pulled there and, and, and what do we expect in terms of being able to qualify for a mortgage? Well, you've got two competing parts right now. One, we know that the federal government and the Bank of Canada are doing a lot to sort of make sure that lending markets remain liquid. Uh, so they have the idea that once things begin to rebound, there might be uh, some sort of competition for lending, but uh, we'll wait and see on that aspect. Uh, but we, but a lot of it is going to be, uh, we're going to have to wait and see how things evolve. Like if the economy re rebounds slowly and the restaurant industry remains impaired uh, and basically income growth remains sluggish, uh, there might be more onerous re impact on terms of lending in the mortgage market and tougher standards that are brought in. Uh, it's really a period of uncertainty, and we're going to just have to wait and see how things evolve. But, but I, 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 I am of the view that, in general, the household sector's ability to carry the level of debt that we've had over the past few years has become impaired. Uh, and so that's not that doesn't necessarily say that everybody's facing the same restrictions, but it does suggest that uh, that there is going there is an underlying vulnerability, and that will be reflected in. Mortgage lenders, they might be more aggressive in terms of their credit allocations and basically uh, credit agencies might become more, more, uh, more uh, acute in terms of, uh, of, of limiting people, people's ability to borrow and, and, be, and increasing the level of stress tests. Uh, hopefully three to four years, things will be back to what we might consider to be normal. Uh, but we, there is going to be a period of uncertainty because we've never gone through an economic hit like this. And we just don't know what the recovery is going to look like. And if you're possibly going to be lending money out to people, uh, you might have a greater degree of uncertainty over whether you'll get paid back. And so it's just, it just one of those things that it might uh, begin to restrain, especially lending in particular aspects of the market, not overall, but particular aspects of the markets could certainly be squeezed. Um, according to Mark Murphy, he says, typically an economic hit like this, we see um, people shifting from uh, cash from stocks to real estate as a risk mitigation um, tactic to secure their wealth from further decline. Considering the economic impact and drop in stocks, would you anticipate a shift in capital into real estate supporting house prices from falling too much? 
Uh, honestly, I that gets very close to offering investment advice, and I can't really do that. So what uh, I will sort of say in terms of some changes in behavior, uh, there is the possibility that we, and the one thing that I'm focusing on and I'll be paying particular close attention to is whether or not we do see people beginning to shift to building precautionary savings. Uh, Canada has basically gone for years by having relatively little savings uh, and we got by quite well. And so, and so I'm, I'm concerned that we will see a number of people that begin to shift towards, you know what, I have to build my savings, uh, whether or not that ends up being reflected in a real estate market or actually in bank accounts, uh, we'll have to wait and see, but uh, I'm not gonna offer a specific investment advice like that. Fair enough, fair enough. That, that's fair, that's <laughs> fair. What I, what I will point the folks to on the line is if you go into rollapage.ca uh, media, uh, surveys and studies, uh, you will find the rationale, the math and the outlook uh, that was revised, that we revised at the uh, beginning of April. So you can see the, uh, the roll of page forecast there for 2020. And I think it will help you as you're explaining some of the dynamics that are very specific to the residential uh, real estate market in Canada and uh, that support our outlook for the year. So, so Phil, that's, that's a great uh, segue to what will be our final question now. Uh, and I'm going to put you in the hot seat, Phil. And sure. this is from William Lowe. And he said, given what David has shared today, um, you know, do you want to adjust any of your um, own forecast in terms of pricing and where we see the housing market going? Yeah, you know what? It's one of the, one of the reasons uh, that I was uh, so keen on having David on the, the, the show today was it's important for us to gather uh, the opinions from professionals who, who study the global and Canadian economy and become educated. You know, your clients will be looking to you for insight. Obviously, you have to translate what David's provided at a, at a macroeconomic level and what the companies provided in terms of a, a national and a major major market forecast and translate that right down into a trading area uh, point in time, a bit of advice for your clients. But overall, um, things are actually looking better than our original, than, than the forecast we put together at the end of March. It was pretty dire. Uh, for example, we expected uh, volumes uh, in the April May time uh, period to be between 10 and 15 percent of normal. Remember, people are asked to uh, shelter at home and only emergency uh, housing needs be satisfied during this time. And the even in the the hardest hit market, which was the Greater Toronto area, volumes were still a third of of normal. And that rose right up to 70% of normal in, in cities like Winnipeg. So the, 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 the way the year's unfolding is actually more positive than our, than our forecast we built uh, at the end of the first quarter, which was only a few weeks into the, uh, the pandemic. So yeah, it's, um, and, and uh, David mentioned at the beginning that the Bank of Canada, uh, the Governor of Bank of Canada, is now saying that their outlook is on the more uh, bullish or optimistic side of the forecast they put together at the beginning of the crisis too. So these are unprece unprecedented and very difficult times, but they are, um, this too shall pass. David, you've been through a few uh, economic downturns during your career. Uh, were, you, were you in this role during the uh, global financial crisis of what, 11 years ago now? Uh, I was. I will say that I actually was coming out of university during the 91 to 93 economic downturn, which you know, was very much almost seemed like a depression at that point for the Canadian yeah. economy. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I stayed in grad school was because of the lack of job prospects. Uh, and uh, actually, just lingering after effect, that's one of the things I've got two kids. My youngest kid is in grade, uh, grade, uh, grade 10 going into grade 11 next year. Uh, I don't know if any of you have kids that are graduating from university or that are going into university next year. 
uh, I feel for you because this is a horrible time to either be trying to enter the labor force or, or think about going to university and sitting in a university lecture room or sitting in your home and paying thousands of dollars for, uh, to attend a university. Uh, and that, that, that aspect actually sort of leads me to uh, the last point about, uh, about you. Like, uh, we, like my forecast was very similar to yours. It's like you're saying, well, given all these restrictions, what do you think could happen to the economy? And things look terrible. And you know, you get to the point about, well, I don't know if I could put this forecast out, but this is what the numbers tell me. And things turn out not to be as bad as you thought. Uh, and so, I, but I think that we also have to realize that this COVID impact, uh, it will have a lasting impact on the economy. It'll leave a mark on the economy. So be thankful that maybe the hit wasn't quite as bad as it was. Uh, be hopeful that things will get better, but uh, thing, things are going to change in the economy and it's gonna take a while for us to get back to whatever the normal is. And so when things go well, chalk that up for do good advice and, 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 and luck and whatever, what have you. Uh, but also realize that there are going to be disappointments during this period of recovery. So don't get too high when things go well, don't get too low when things go poorly. Realize that this is all part of the process of the economy returning to some sort of normal. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Uh, this was a, a fascinating discussion. Thanks for everybody for tuning in across uh, the country. Of course, all of the, you who are watching this in a tape fashion and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you for Philosophy Fridays on uh, Friday afternoon, next time uh, we get together uh, nationally. David, thank you and uh, stay safe. You too, thank you. Thanks everybody.